All right, 1 Samuel 13. I got my eyes fixed. That's why I can see you. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Um, New American Standard. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Samuel 13. Um, as the old preachers say, this is a familiar passage of Scripture. <laughs> Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. I want to translate that, okay? Because of what you've done, your legacy is disrupted. And we're in this legacy series, right? Because of what you've done, your legacy is disrupted. He says, but now your kingdom shall not endure. Your legacy shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. We know that person is David. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Can I argue this here for a moment and be in context? The truth of the matter is, uh, Anderson, is that it looks as though, and it appears as though, God made provision for Israel with David, but he actually had plans for Saul. And oftentimes when we study Saul, we preach about Saul, talk about Saul, we always beat Saul down. Today, today we're not going to beat him down. We're just going to explore him some. So in, endure me for the next 30 minutes on this case study on Saul. Um, uh, we'll see what God does. But I'm going to title this this. You ready? Don't be foolish. Yeah. Don't be foolish. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share the word of God once again. To break bread with your sons and your daughters. And Lord, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to say and do what you do and say best. I'm asking you to strengthen my body and strengthen my heart, my mind, and allow my mind to be in tune with the Holy Ghost. And even your people, let them receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to change them, change their mind, their soul. Holy Ghost, do what you do best. Sit in this room. Bless us all. We give you permission to do whatever you want to do. It's your house. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Clap your hands all over the room. On your way down, just nudge four people around you and tell them, don't be foolish, whatever you do. Tell them in this legacy year, don't be foolish. Thank you so much, E. Praying for you, family, as y'all get ready to uh, let's keep the Hopkins family in prayer. Uh, Pastor DJ, Pastor Don Hopkins, his wife, his family, Eric as well, as they get ready to, um, to um, bury uh, Paul Paul, Deacon Hopkins. So we honor them as well. We celebrate them. And also, please keep those who are sick, Asa and Kev are sick, Prophet Kwame, others that are out. We bless them in Jesus' name. All right. Um, let's do some work here. Y'all ready for this? In every generation, um, <laughs> in every generation, God seemingly builds since creation with a man. Now, I don't want you to be intense, ladies, because I'm not talking about man, meaning just men. I'm talking about mankind. But for you political correct people, I'm probably going to upset you because I'm not going to do all that. <laughs> so from the beginning of time, creation, after God builds an earth and shapes it and forms it, he builds a man. He constructs a man. He builds a man. He gives the man reason, meaning, definition, and then he breathes into man the ruach of God which is the intellect and the mind of God. It wasn't just wind, and it wasn't just breath, breath as we know it. Because if we can take the breath of God and dumb it down to our finite understanding, 
we'll assume it's just the cessation that he gives us that causes us to expand and contract. No. The breath of God is more than just wind. Wrapped in his wind is his intellect. Wrapped in his wind is his imagination. Wrapped in his wind is his will. And should I even say, one of the definitions for the Spirit of God in the Greek is pneuma, but in the Old Covenant, it is ruach. If you've been around me for a while, you know I've taught that when God ruached into Adam or into male and female, into mankind, he didn't just blow, he regurgitated. That Moses wrote the idea that the word ruach, which is not a Paleo Hebrew word, but it's a word that Moses concocted as he wrote it, trying to figure out how did God blow into man. So instead of having a word to uh, ascribe to the thought, he did what we call in English onomatopoeia. He wrote out how it sounded when he saw it. That when God looked at mankind and breathed into mankind, Moses, when he saw it, because I believe God showed it to him in the cleft of the rock, when he saw the beginning, he wrote, he regurgitated, he ruach into man. And the sound caused what was uh, lifeless in the mud, lifeless onto the ground, take breath. And now it has the mind and the will of God. Adam is without sin, he's without blemish, he's impeccable, he's just like his father. And so is the female. And when God puts her to sleep and brings her out, she is just like God. God has always imparted to and needed a body to fulfill destiny and his will in the earth. Say amen to this. And we see this trend throughout the entirety of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, even through Judges, Joshua and Judges. But can I argue that for a moment that every generation God looks for a man or woman, but looks for a man that he can designate or raise up. God is always trying to hunt through every generation, every time, every time. And he's looking to see who can I use for the purposes that are mine for people who are either yet to be revealed or people that are lost right now. He is always looking for a person. God prophesies, literally, prophesies to the snake and tells him that the seed of the woman will crush your head. But it wasn't until Abraham that he could start to begin the journey of causing this particular prophetic word to come to pass. Wasn't through Seth, wasn't through others, it was through Abraham. And through Abraham, who was the progenitor, progenitor of this thing we call Christianity or the Hebrew people, God begins to fulfill the idea or at least begin the idea of a prophetic word coming to pass that will literally spoil the plan of hell. And he does it through the man called Abraham. Say Abraham. And so God now says that because of Abraham's faith is counted to him as righteousness, he found him a man. He found him a man. Can I argue for a moment that I wonder if Abraham was the first man he called? I'm, I'm safe here. Don't worry about it. I'm safe. Yeah, I'm safe. Because in context, we only know that what's written for us is what we need to know about how things began. But I wonder if Abraham was the first guy that God spoke to. Or maybe he's the first one to obey. It could be that God had been speaking to men for generations. But he finally had one that decided, I will obey what I just heard this God who I do not have context for. Relationship with who my father did not give me. But I will obey what he said. And I will go to a land that he will show me. <laughs> There's a whole difference there because uh, I believe that there are certain things that are written for us to know. And then there are things that are not recorded. The Bible says Jesus did all kinds of miracles. And there were many that he did not, that were not recorded. It is possible. I didn't say it's the truth. But it is possible. I didn't say it can't be. But it is possible that God may have asked other men questions. 
And only Abram was the only one bold enough to trust what he heard. Nudge your neighbor for the first time and say, neighbor, God is always looking for a person. He's looking for a person. I'm going to take this call off. He's always looking for a person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Abraham. Isaac. Jacob. <laughs> they believe that they, they walked into a place because they knew that Pawpaw, Daddy and Pawpaw walked in faith. So obviously we are out here in faith. It goes all the way down, and God finds Joseph. He's looking for a man. And then God says, if I can't find one, I'll raise one up. My people have been in bondage for literally 400 years, and I hear the cries of my people screaming out to me in oppression. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, make sure, that even though they're killing all these babies, I'm going to make sure that this one kid is wrapped into an ark, pushed down the Nile River, filled with crocodiles and snakes and village people who are dangerous, and I'm going to make sure that the very people that are trying to kill him Raise him up. Wow, only God can cause you to come to being in the presence of danger. That God can hide you in plain sight. You can live in the house of your very own enemies and they could be responsible for financing your life. This is interesting here because Cause, 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 you see it? Because, cause Moses is now not one that God uh, is just looking for. He said, if I can't find one, cause all of mine's, they in slavery. Y'all don't want this. They mine's not together. Some, they, because, oh, I'll get there in a minute. Their mind is not together. So I got to raise one up young enough that I can influence into freedom first. There's always one in the bloodline that is a little bit different than everybody else. He raises him up. He raises him up, Eric. And uh, he says, uh, you know, this is my God. This is Moses. And Moses, y'all know the story. Moses, whose name means to be drawn out. He literally draws out all of Israel and brings them into the wild. 400 years, they was in the wilderness. And for the first time, Denisha, we's free. But it didn't take them long to start complaining. I got a problem that when uh, deliverance comes and you don't change the mind, Is it possible to be free and still be bound? It's it's possible to have the devil cast out of your soul and you still have the same trends that get you in trouble again. This is why when God finally does it, you can't go back to it. But until the mind is shifted, You'll always repeat it. (laughs) Moses, Pastor Moses is literally in the wild with what the Bible says is stiff-necked people. (laughs) What? Stiff-necked. I said, Lord, that's an incredible word. I know hard-headed. I've heard that. I I was told that when I was a kid. You hard-headed, you know. (laughs) But stiff-necked? Is that the same thing as hard head? Stiff neck literally speaks to the fact that they could not see it another way. That they were stiff with, with, because when the neck is stiff, you can only see things one way. So God says, I can't bring this kind of people into the promise. So Moses, you're going to lead them. You can't go neither, though, because uh, you've been around them so long that they're rubbing off on you. You strike what I tell you to speak to. 
You can't go neither. So then God has to raise up another one. Moves us right on into Joshua. Joshua comes with the children of Israel and Moses is dead in Joshua chapter 1. And the word of the Lord came to Joshua, whose name is Yeshua. It's, it's literally the same root system as Jesus. Yeshua, the son of Nun. Nun means posterity, which means he's always moving. It's a type and shadow of Jesus. That Jesus is the son of God. God is posterious. God is never ending. He is eternal. He is none. And then Joshua is a type of savior to Israel, bringing people into promise. And so Joshua <laughs> is now dealing with the same, the same bloodline, different generation. I said, oh my God, help me, Jesus. See, these are the kids of the one that died. Which means they were raised by those who didn't make it. Though they look different, they still got the same DNA. Just a little bit better than the past group. They get them into to, to Canaan. They start defeating all the ites. One day I'm preaching all these ites again. They whoop all, all the ites, all the ites. And then God says, okay, Joshua gets old. It's Canaan's turn. Can I walk through this? And Canaan is now in leadership. And he's leading. He's an older man. His name means dog. He's just leading the people in. And he's got great whatever. And then God says, okay, this technique of how we're doing it has to shift something. Because they don't always listen. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move into a season of judges. And I'm going to let, I'm going to let the 12 tribes be dispersed and let them govern amongst themselves. And uh, because this, they can't move as one unit, I'll separate all 12 of them. You can govern this part of land, your part of land, and your part of land. And the judges come to help them facilitate this. In uh, typical fashion, they still betray God. They still betray one another, and we move on forward. So Deborah comes into power. Y'all know Deborah? I got to move on. And then there's people like uh, uh, Gideon that comes into power, and there's, there's Samson in the book of Judges. But I want to peruse all the way over. If we could speed up the text just for a moment. Let's step right on into 1 Sam. 1 Sam is one of my favorite books because, uh, y'all mind if I take my time with this? I love I love First Samuel because First Samuel is is it's the first book I read in its entirety. I saw myself in the storyline of David. I I literally did. I was like, man, this guy's my life. Uh, he's just as challenged as I am, and uh, it, yeah, I love it. But but what really got me was not David. It was what led me to David. Can I walk through this for a moment? 1 Samuel is one of the most incredible books because it's a book that really details how God took them away from the tribal system and was bringing them back to one system. That before they was led by, by Moses and led by Aaron, and, and who was a priest, and, and led by Canaan, I mean by Caleb and others, and such, then the judges. But then now God is bringing them back to a place of leadership, but now it's a priest. Hood. It's a priesthood again. And now the priests are leading the people of God. But what's happening in 1 Samuel is that the priests are not on their job. There's a particular priest. He's an overweight man by the name of Eli. He has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who are literally having relations, if I can use that word, with all of the different women that were coming to bring their sacrifice to the temple. And uh, taking their seething forks and sticking it into people's sacrifices and eating it for themselves. And Eli, instead of rebuking his sons for making a mockery of the temple. So God says, I'm going to judge this. But in the meantime, as a young man who's being raised up in that house, whose mother was barren, who is now begging God for a baby, God gives her a baby. The baby's name is Samuel. She brings it back to God because that was her vow. And he is raised in a, in, a, in a church, in a culture of toxicity, and he's prophetic. Watch this. And the toxic preacher taught him how to hear God. I need you to know somebody and say, you can learn from anybody. You can learn from anybody. Don't discredit every gift. Some gifts you can still learn. God can use them momentarily. Yeah. 
Something interesting happens. Is that uh, he's like, you know, hey, 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 hey. I'm going to teach you how to hear God. And then all of a sudden, they get into war. And when they get into war, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. Something else interesting happens. Eli is sitting on his chair. And when he finds out that the, see, the ark is symbolic of the presence of God. But it's a type of shot of Jesus as well. Because it is a box made of Shedem wood. It's the toughest of the acacia wood family. It's an indestructible substance. It's a, it's, it's a wood that you can't burn or break. It's like the body of Jesus. His, <laughs> no bone on that man was broken. You may have tattered the box, but you did not break its shape. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's overlaid in gold. Gold in the Old Covenant means deity. It was gold within and gold without. That's Jesus. He is all man, but at the same time, he is deity within and he is God without. On top of that is a mercy seat. This is lid. Where the sacrifices are sprinkled upon the blood, God consumes it and all Israel's sins are atoned for. Same thing with Jesus. It's the mission of Jesus. When he finds out that the ark is gone, symbolic of the presence of God, it's even a type of shut up Jesus. When he finds out that the grace or the mercy or the favor, because wherever they brought the ark of the covenant, they would win seas were split the Jordan would open up whatever the ark of the covenant was they knew victories on the other side of it but now the favor is gone that old heavyweight prophet priest sitting in his chair and the Bible says he fell out of his chair and because of his weight he broke his neck and he died ooh what happens with preachers who consume at large amounts? You think I'm talking about food? Who consume at large amounts? Who let everything go? No one ever gets chastened, especially the sun. That's for another day. So then what happens is he, he literally dies, and uh, this young man, Sam, Samuel, can I call him Sammy? This young man, Sammy, is now at a place, Tanisha, where Sam is the man. The funny thing is, is how he was raised, though. He's the man raised in a chaotic house. Can you imagine what he had to work through? in order to be a righteous priest. Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. Because when you really want to do it right and you come from dysfunction, it's a process to learn how to do it better when all you saw was toxicity. I may not be talking to everybody, but I'm talking to at least 25 people in the room that say I grew up in dysfunction and I've been working like heck not to look like what I came from. If you knew who raised me, you'd be amazed how I came out the way I came out. When you see me, you don't see me. You see my process. I'm on the other side of getting better. That's why you got to be patient with certain stories because you don't know their background. You don't know where they came from. You don't know what they was reared up in. I'm hanging on for dear life. If you knew that my granddad touched me, my grandmother cussed me out, my mama said I was no good, my daddy walked away, my parents fought each other in my face. Trying to get better. It's a process. No, somebody saying it's a process. A process. I didn't get here overnight. <laughs> I didn't get here overnight. It took a while to put that, put the weed down. It took a while to put that bottle down. It took a while to keep my hands to myself. I didn't get there overnight. 
I didn't get here overnight. I didn't get here overnight. It's been a process to stop cussing. I didn't get here overnight. So Samuel grows up in a toxic house, toxic cultures, and my Bible says his sons were toxic. Now that messes me up. That God was like, hey, 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 I need to find somebody else to get this too. Samuel, you're getting up there. But even your boys are crazy. Woo! And here's the thing though. Samuel knew it. That's the difference between him and Eli. Is that Samuel agreed with God. You sure are right. I did my best. I wonder how they got messed up though. If I can use my theological imagination. If we could uh, <laughs> exegetically tell the story within the context of the text. Without any eisegesis. Can I, yeah. Can I, can I imagine or reimagine that it is possible that Samuel may have spent too much time in the temple? Because though Eli taught him how to hear God, he also taught him not to deal with his sons. So God's like, hey, I got to work this thing. I got I to gotta get another man. How can I do this? Well, I'm going to do this. And before God even did it, the people betrayed God again. What, look at your neighbor, what did they do? Let me tell you what these fools, these fools did. These fools said, we want a king. God was okay with them having a priest. He was okay with them having a leader. He was okay with them having a judge. He raised all that up. What he was not okay with is you wanting a king. He said, we want a king. God said, oh, my God. Y'all didn't lost. See, see, what happens is resemblance of slavery. Yeah. 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 Resemblance of 400 years of oppression begin to manifest in the future. Egypt had a king. Give us a king. I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm imagining. We want a king. God says, okay, you want a king? I'm going to give y'all a king. And uh, he tells Samuel, we're going to anoint one. Here we go. Saul. Saul gets a bad rap in a lot of churches. Because we love to get to David. But in order to get to David, you got to get through Saul. Can I argue that there is no David without Saul? I'm wondering if there was supposed to ever be a David. I'm wondering if, I wonder if it was supposed to be through Saul that the Messiah would come. Because God did choose him. And he didn't just choose anybody. Let me explain Saul. Saul was from a small tribe, the Matrites, a people who were of the tribe of Benjamin. They was a clan. And his daddy's name was Kish. And Kish was wealthy. He was filthy rich. And, uh, and so Saul comes from Kish. And one day he's walking to trying to find these donkeys. His father had said lost. And as he's walking, he bumps into the prophet. Who knew he was coming? 
And the prophet Samuel sees him and says, man, so I talked to him about the kingdom. And Saul's so like, what are you talking about? And I want you to come eat with me here. And uh, we're going to eat on the hill. We're going to have a good dinner. We're going to sacrifice. And then I'm going to tell you where the donkeys are. And I'm going to give you a couple of instructions. He's like, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. All this is going on, man. And, but, 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 but when they pick Saul, the Bible says that Saul was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. That... God picked him like that because I think he was trying to show Israel their heart. It wasn't about picking him because he was tall. It was picking him because he knew their heart. They wanted somebody who was bigger than all of them. They needed, <laughs> they needed a representative who was broader than them. He was a handsome, tall man, brawny fella, if I can imagine him. And if he's tall in that culture, most of me, he might have been like 6'1", six, 6'2", six, because in that culture, most of your Hebrew men were like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. And so if he's tall then, he's probably 6-something, you know. He's not taller than Goliath. Goliath is a giant to him, 9 foot tall. But now he sees himself. He's taller than everybody else. They see him, and the people look upon him like, oh, yeah, that must be the king because he's taller than everybody else. But when it was time to make him king and call him out, the Bible is clear in 1 Sam chapter 10, verse 22, that therefore they inquire for the Lord. Has the man come yet? Has come here yet? So the Lord said, behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. Let me argue this real quick. As tall as he was, he was afraid. Now we argue, and we get mad at Saul, but Saul was a man of fear before he even had authority. And I think we give him a bad rap because we, we, don't under, we underestimate the fact that Saul was reared in a place of fear. That instead of thinking about the idea of leading uh, 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 Israel, he's hiding amongst the luggage. Their king is full of fear. The man that God has picked to lead Israel is a scaredy cat, which means he doesn't take risks. He's nervous. He's apprehensive. He's full of anxiety. And some of you can see yourself in that place. Why would God pick me when I got issues? Y'all act like Saul asked for this. Saul didn't ask for this. The people asked for this. And God responded to the people's cry because a generation was waiting to be, for God to, be, to reveal them and to bring them into this place of power and to bring them into a place of dominance. And God chose somebody who did not feel equipped to do the job. And sometimes when God finds a man, he always finds people that are always not necessarily qualified to do what he's calling them to do. How do I know that? Moses. Had difficulty with language. Y'all think Moses stuttered. You've been reading them European Bibles too much. Moses' speech impediment was not a, 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 a tongue issue. It was a language barrier. He didn't speak his native tongue. That's why Aaron spoke for him. Because Aaron was fluent. <sighs> so Saul is a young man whom God chooses. He's 30 years of age. He doesn't feel qualified to lead hundreds of thousands of people. And you just told me yesterday... Are y'all here? And so I think we judge Saul. I think we give, we, we go after Saul. We attack Saul a lot in our preaching. But as I began to psychologically look at Saul, I had to say to myself, ooh, be compassionate. By the grace of God, there go yourself. God would always call you, and you're not ready to do that. And when God really gives you something, it's much bigger than you think. So Saul now is, is leading, or about to lead, he's head and shoulders above everybody else, and he represents the choice that God had for Israel. He represented their heart. Uh, his personal constitution, as they were, you know, was a direct mirror of God's ability to discern 
their heart. Can we walk through Saul's mistakes, though? Uh, Saul, because he was a man of so much fear, it opened him up to some other things that caused his destiny to be jeopardized. I'm going to give you four prophetic warnings for the rest of 2023 and beyond. You ready? The first warning is found in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Here's the case study. 1 Samuel, thank y'all for letting me do this. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 7. I'm going to read this in a New Living Translation. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 7. 1 Samuel 13, verse 7. 1 Samuel 13, verse 7. Verse 7, verse 7, verse 7, verse 7. Look what it says. Here. It says, uh, is that verse 7? Yeah. Also, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of, G of Gad. Um, mine's reading different. That's New American Standard. <laughs> New Living Translation. I'll read New American Standard. What have you got? Also, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Next verse. Now, he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. He was waiting on the priest. Waiting on the preacher, waiting on the prophet to get there, and the prophet did not show up in time to do his to do his to do his thing, which was to offer to the Lord. And the people were scattering from Saul. Mm -hmm. So Saul said, Bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Number 10 says, and as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, which means watch this, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet and greet him. Look at verse 11. Look at attention. But Samuel said, what have you done? Yeah. And Saul said, well, be, 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 hold on. Because I saw the people were scattered from me. Uh, 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 and that you, you wasn't here when you said you were going to be here. You know, and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Uh, 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 uh. Next verse, y'all. Therefore, I said... Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord, so I forced myself. Can I read that? He said, he said he did what? I need y'all to talk to me like you're not Presbyterian. He did what? He forced himself. I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolish. You didn't obey what God told you to do. And because of that, then he says, God would have established your legacy forever. Verse 14. But now your legacy will not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself somebody else. Which means God is about to raise up somebody else to do what you were supposed to do. Oh, here's the issue here in your legacy year. You ready for this? I said, are you ready for this? I said, are you ready for this? You bet not move in the grace he did not assign over your life. Whatever you do this year, don't try to be what God didn't commission you to be. You can't build with somebody else's grace. You can't build in somebody else's assignment. Now, I know it to be true. But if I could parallel David, David did something different. Saul had got into the culture because he's a fearful man. And because he's fearful, he started doing things that were outside of his assignment. And when you are afraid, you do things outside of your assignment. You'll even operate in what you think will keep the people around you. This is interesting here because David had an opportunity to do the same thing. Remember, Saul's so used to that. Saul says, David, put on my armor. Come on. Come on. Come on. Because <laughs> he thinks everybody wants to do. Maybe he thought in David he would see him. And David passed that and said, no, I don't need yours. That's too big. I need, I need my own. You see the difference between the two? Now, it's interesting here because uh, Saul is taller than everybody else. David is not. 
Saul is, is, is a brawny fella. David's ruddy. Uh, Saul is beloved by his father, Kish. David is not. Uh, Saul is, um, Saul is uh, uh, anointed with a flask. And David's anointed with a ram's horn. I don't have time to get into that. Well, both of them have different responsibilities. The flask is temporal. The ram's horn is for life. I ain't got time to deal with that. So what's the second thing that happened? You ready for this? 1 Samuel 15. Go there. 1 Samuel 15, verse 5. You can stand in New American Standard. 1 Samuel 15, verse 5. Shout that with me. 1 Samuel 15, verse 5. This is the other thing that Saul did that messed up everything. This is what messed up everything. You ready? <laughs> Read it with me. Saul came. So hold up. Number one, don't move in somebody else's grace. Whatever you do this year, don't, don't, just because you see them doing it, doesn't mean that's your office. Just because you see them about to start that kind of business, don't mean you go do the same thing. That's not your legacy. You got to tap into the thing designed for you. Not the thing that's trendy. Look at the second thing. It's the second one. I told you I ain't going to holler a lot today. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Now, I'm going to give you some background. God told him, I want you to kill the Amalekites. I want you to wipe them jokers out. And this is how hard God is. Y'all think everybody, God just love. God just loves. He loves everybody and all their struggles. God just loves. He's a loving God. Why do you preach hate? Now, you know, hate's the, the new word for correction, but why do you preach hate? God, God is love. He likes you to be the way you are. He accepts you the way you are, and he does. But he don't let you stay that way. He'll keep messing with you till you change. That's for all of us. Present company, not in, excluded. Notwithstanding. So, um, so God told him, he said, man, I want you to kill everybody. He said, listen, 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 listen to this, Yvette. He said, don't just kill the Amalekites. Kill their babies. Wait, pause, hold on. Y'all don't want this. <laughs> Y'all don't want this, guys. God said, not Saul. God said, Lejean, kill the babies. The sheep, the ox, all of it. If they touch it, kill it. If it walks and breathes, kill it. If it belongs to the Amalekites, Amalekites, destroy it. I don't want to see none of it. Woo. Saul says, I got you. Let's do this. Oh, here we go. So he set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, go depart. Go down from the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed the kindness to all the sons of Israel when you came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites. From Havilah, as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He even captured Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. I'll say that, Lord. But Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless that they destroyed. Oh, Lord, you ready for this? God told him, as he's securing legacy, y'all, for Israel, destroy everything. 
it's an enemy to me. He kept the king alive, the best of the cattle, the best of the sheep, the best of the firstlings. Kept that. Anything that was worthless, he destroyed that. But anything that was good, he kept that. Samuel sees him again like, you dummy. Can I paraphrase? You don't knock out everything God, didn't he tell you? To destroy everything? I said, Lord, I know in the Old Testament, I mean, I know in, 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 in Exodus, there's tension with the Amalekites. There's tension also with Joshua. Like, there's, there's beef there. Like, you know, Amalekites, all the ites have meanings, though. Jebusites, Gip, you know, the Jebusites and, and uh, uh, all ites, Amorites. All of the ites, they got meaning, though. Do you know who the Amalekites were, though? The Amalekites, that group right there, <laughs> they were what you call in Hebrew the uh, valley dwellers. <laughs> they were the valley dwellers. They represented, you know, fatigue, depression, sadness. They were the ones that would deal with you when you came out of the mountain. They're waiting on you when you would come down. <laughs> that once you had been ascended and you decide to come down, it's the Amalekites that were there to fight you in the valley. And God said, I got a problem with this, man, because uh, you didn't kill the ones that fight us in the valley. Ooh. See, Jerusalem... Is there. Zion's there. When I come down here, is when I got to fight with the Amalekites. God says, when y'all descend after you've ascended, I want you to wipe them out because he knew in the future. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and said, son, you got to tell the people that in this season, you can't afford to leave anything that would depress you. Anything that would discourage you from building in this legacy year. But it's, it's, the, it's the king that he left. Agog. Agog names means to be on top. It really means to overtop. Another one translates for it means the fiery thing that overtops. I said, ooh, it's the strong man of discouragement. <laughs> Pastor, you know what's interesting about this? Saul did die. He fell on his own sword, self-prophecy. But it was an Amalekite. that said he was the one that finished him off. I, Pastor, I asked myself a question. Hold on now. That Bible does not lie. If the Bible is right, I know the Bible is right. Somebody's wrong. If the Bible is right, I thought Saul killed all of the Amalekites. If he killed all of the Amalekites except for Agog, where did this boy come from? Can I argue something? I wonder if. I wonder if this boy was a descendant of the king. I wonder if, because as a king, you had multiple situations. I wonder if the strong man that Saul did not take care of has seed planted in other places.
that manifested years down the line to be the one to finish off Saul. Number two, wipe out all discouragement. Because while you're building, the enemy going to try to discourage you. And you got to go after the strong man. We almost done with this case study, all right? Can I keep going? So number one, don't move in a grace that's not yours. Number two, you got to kill discouragement. Right? Y'all want number three? Number three is found in 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. Just go to verse 17, and the New American Standard is fine. Read it with me as loud as you can. Samuel said, is it not true? Though you were little, ooh, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord. Here's another thing that is an issue with Saul. Saul didn't see himself the way God saw him. Here's number three. I got to stop. You got to learn to start training yourself to see yourself the way God sees you. As long as you are little in your own eyes, you will never build legacy for a generation yet to be born. And here's the problem with people who come from 400 years of oppression. It's hard to be big when little always reaching for you. You know, somebody asked me a question. D, I think it was you. We had a conversation this week. Uh, this is for any, any, everybody. We had a conversation this week. He says, do you think that it's possible that um, certain people groups are victims to what happened to them hundreds of years ago. I said, absolutely. However, comma. However, comma. I'll say that again for the hearing impaired. However, comma. After Jesus, all of that that was connected to me, through revelation has been broken from me. Therefore, even though it may have happened to ancestry, it does not mean it has the legal right to cause me to still suffer. Here's the problem. Some of y'all want to hold on to Why you want to hold on to it is because could it be that you're little in your own eyes? Could it be that because you're so little in your own eyes that you have to give yourself excuses for not becoming? But the mindset is God wants to shift your thinking. Lay your hands on your head and say, God, shift my thinking. You can't allow yourself to see yourself as small no more. I don't care what your mama said about you. I don't care what your grandmother said about you. I don't care what your dad didn't give you. You can't allow, I don't care if you did not graduate from this particular university or school. As long as you can see yourself in the will of God and know that his thoughts toward you are greater than your thoughts over yourself. Your assignment is the warfare of the mind, not people. You got to come into agreement with the word of God over yourself. And come out of agreement with the lie through the bloodline. Look at somebody and say, the bloodline lies. That's why you got to be born again. Because when you get born again, you get connected to a whole new bloodline. Lies. You can't allow yourself to be little. Come on here. Take a deep breath. You can't allow yourself. Breathe that out. You can't allow yourself to be little. 
Your days of talking yourself down are coming, help me Holy Ghost, are coming to an end. Quit starting stuff and stopping it because you don't believe that you'll ever break through in the thing God gave you to do for him. Quit thinking that no one will ever find you. No one will ever discover you. You are known by the God of the universe. Who cares? If they don't see you, God will make a people. He will raise a people up. You can't allow yourself to start thinking low about you. His thoughts about you. As Pastor Lisa says, it's like the sand. The grains of sand that you can't individually separate. That's how many thoughts he has about you. Saul, even though he came from means, still saw himself as, it's amazing. He is taller than everybody. <laughs> Bigger than everyone. And still sees himself as smaller. You can be gifted. You can be talented. You can be educated. You can be well liked. You can be kind. You can have character. You can have the Holy Ghost and still be small. Because it's not about what you got. It's about what you know. I was uh, thinking about some things I'm called, called um, my God, last point I'm done. Things I, I know God's called me to do. And the devil of discouragement, a valley dweller, he said to me, well, how are you going to do it? Because to me, he's a punk, so he talks that way. <laughs> how are you going to do it? How are you going to make that happen? That's the way I, I don't perceive his voice as dope as God's. How are you going to do it? How are you going to make that happen? How are you going to pay for it? They're like, that ain't none of my business. That ain't none of my business. What is my business is to believe. Yeah. And here's the other part. Because you and your dreadlocks are attacking me, I got to say that because I'm bald. Because you and your locks, I'm just, I'm just hating. <laughs> because you and your bungee cord weave. <laughs> you know, the bungee cord weave, you pull it and put it back. <laughs> but because he is even talking to me yeah. is a sign to me because <laughs> everything you say is a lie anyway so because you tell me I can't do it it's because God is saying that I am going to do it that when the devil tells you that you can't build it it's because God has anointed you to build it look at your neighbor and say neighbor God's called me to build something in this season and I got to come into agreement with him. I can't agree with my fear. I got to agree with the word of God over myself. And my Bible says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you got a problem with that, take it up with God. It is he that has made me and not me myself. Here's the last one. You might as well stay because I'm done. First, first Sam 15, 24. Go to verse 24 and I'm done. I thought it was going to be 25 minutes. Look at verse 24. Read it with me as loud as you can. Then Saul said to Sam, I have sinned. Mm -hmm. he, made, he acknowledged it. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord. In your words, why did he do it? Because I feared the people. Let me tell you something. If you're going to build legacy in this year, you can't be concerned about what other people think about you. I need you to high five somebody and say, no matter who leaves me, no matter who stays, 
I will not be brought into foolishness this year. You're not going to pull me off this wall and you're not going to bring me into your foolishness. Whether you leave or you stay, as long as the hand of God is on my life, I'm going to leave something in the earth. I ain't got time to preach it the way I want to. But can you nudge three people around you and tell them, say, neighbor, on this communion Sunday, the last Sunday of January 2023, I came to tell you and your mama, I will not be foolish with my legacy. I don't know who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm talking to two or three people, but I will not be foolish with the thing God gave me to build. Lay your hands on yourself. I will make good choices. I will deal with discouragement and I'll operate in my own grace. But the last thing I will not do, I won't let you talk me out of what God has purposed over my life. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, either you riding with me or you riding against me. But since we're on the same team, this year is the year that we're building legacy for the future of the Lord's church. Clap your hands all over the room. Come on, give God praise. High five somebody around. Tell you, I'm building something. I'm building something. Come on, tell him I'm building something. I'm building something. Tell him I'm building something. No, get out your eye. Tell him I'm building something. And I refuse to come down. I'm building something. And I refuse to be disrupted. I'm building something. And I won't stop until my children's children knew I was here. I won't stop until my great grandbabies knew I was here. I'm leaving something. I'm leaving land. I'm leaving LLCs. I'm leaving deeds. I'm leaving trusts. I'm leaving buildings. I'm leaving schools. I'm leaving something. And I'm leaving money. I'm leaving something. Don't you act foolish. Don't you act foolish. Don't you forfeit your legacy being discouraged. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of discouragement over your children. I come against a scheme that will tell them that they can't build, that they can't dream it, that they can't see it be realized. In the name of Jesus, we cut off the head of the demon of discouragement. Loose here. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over your mind, the blood over your imagination. Be free to dream. Be free to build. Be free to think. I don't care what the it is. You're going to build in this season. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. He said, Kevin, what's happening in your church? I said, brother, I don't know. I just really feel everybody know we in legacy. I think that what's happening is the people of God are responding Three years were taken from you. Before a pandemic, you were coasting. You was on your way. You know, I, I'm going to share this again just so it bears repeating. We had tapped into the year of what they call 5780 in Hebrew. It's the year or the decade, not year. It's the decade of the open mouth. 5780 in the Hebrew calendar is where we are because we're Christians. We're not on the Gregorian, we live by the Gregorian calendar. But the Hebrew calendar, which is God's gematria, is how we discern time. God gave that number system to the Jews, to the Hebrews, for the purpose of us getting to know who he is. Say amen to this. So 5780 was the decade of the open mouth. We're in 5783. But it's still the decade of the open mouth. That meant... That when 5780 came, which was September, Yom Kippur of uh, 2019, right before we had mantles, 
We're already in a brand new year, just that the people of God in America don't always know that. We wait to receive it and come into the revelation December 31st. But when it happened, in China, <laughs> how that guy used to say, in China, <laughs> in China, in China, literally, the same time the year had changed in, he, in, in Israel, uh, they started wearing masks in China. Now, you didn't know that because, you know, Americans, they, they don't talk about us. We so arrogant over here. Every other nation studies our nation, and we don't study no nations. It's arrogant. And so 5780 opened up, and we were over here having a good time, and people started getting sick around December. Y'all thought it just happened in March, right? No. It was happening in November. Some of y'all was sick and didn't even know. But because you didn't know, you survived it. You know, of course, for anything that goes with time, it gets worse. For time, it gets worse. So one strand becomes another strand, it gets worse. And, uh, and we lost some incredible people. But one thing I need to tell you is that it was the decade or is the decade of the open mouth. And I thought the mockery of that, that the mockery that the year or the decade of the open mouth, which means I can say a thing, we had to wear masks. Look at the mystery of that. And you think it's coincidence? So everybody's unable to say. We even scared to talk to one another. And I understand it. I, I understand it. To make mockery of the church. Where were the healing revivals and crusades when that happened? I was waiting on somebody to swing their white suit and, and hundreds of people with COVID pass out and get healed. It was mockery. So for two and a half, three years, we lost momentum. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the body. Now that we're back, some of us are back, back, back. But now that we're back, just like Noah, some stuff did survive the flood. They get off the boat, and you're on the wine. And one uncovers the father. You see, it survived. We come out of this, and I'm looking at us online. And I'm saying, man, some of the stuff I think that God was going to use that to kill still came back. We play, but ten boys all holding each other at the altar with the tightest britches on. It, It's not the Holy Ghost. I'm a 45 year old man. That's mockery. I know when it's real. I know when it's fake. Some of this stuff is river dancing. You clogging in Jesus' name. Let me tell you what's coming back. The fear of the Lord is coming back to his church. Fear of the Lord is coming back to his church. People will fear the Lord. I ain't talking about preachers. And the preachers need to fear him. We don't call sin, sin. Everything ain't struggle. Some stuff is sin. So... So in this legacy here, yeah. you got to fight what's fighting you. There's graceful mistakes, y'all. 
ain't a whole lot of grace for settle. I need you to be non-negotiable about what you're leaving. I'm trying to push you in your head. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I want the Holy Ghost to just shake you till you walk out this place like I am leaving something. I refuse to just go to work and then die. I want my name in a library. In 30, 40 years, they should be able to check your book out at the library. Anitra, it's not just you working at a school, baby. It's you building a program. It's you building what you wanted to see. And it'd be different if he didn't show it to you. But he already did. Build it right out the plan. Let him ruach on that thing. That's your legacy. It's ministry, all of it. You are multifaceted. You sing. I'm gonna say this. You preach. You prophesy. You act. you I know you felt like you're done you're not done lift your hands man you're not done son I know that hurt the last situation this ain't that it's new for you it's new and the thing is you're weeping because you sense it already. You know it. I've been through this, I've been through so. We all been through. It's new, lift those hands, let me pray for you. Lord, I do thank you. I do, for your word is life to us. It is sustenance. We thank you for your word. You've sent your word, and your word has healed us. We thank you for your word. Ooh, and we repent for being slowful with the things you've given us. <laughs> Take the next 30 seconds. You need to do that. You need to repent. Ask him to forgive you. He'll do it. Come on. Open your mouth. You can't think that. You got to say that. You didn't think yourself into it. You talked yourself into it. Now talk yourself right out of it. Yeah, you wasted time. He redeems time, but you didn't waste it. Come on, open your mouth. Be obedient. We talk about your legacy, your story, your family. Go back to school. Get your education. Some of you are supposed to have your master's and your, your doctorate. The bachelors, go get it. You got tired, I get it, I understand. Go get it. Your next depends on you having language for it. Right now, you don't have the language, but you're finna get the language. You're about to get the language. Lord, I prophesy over your children that over the next, over the next, uh, over the next, Three and a half months, Lord. Oh, by May uh, 5th, May 6th, May 7th, that many would have began the process of a whole new journey of what they're building. I release the grace over you. Thank you, Father. The grace to start again. 
Mama Jacob, start again. The grace to start again. The grace to begin again. Yeah. Yeah. The grace to begin again. Build it again. Build it again.